Hello and welcome to the Game Pit. This is episode 106. I'm Sean and here's Ronan. Hello, hello. You're very welcome back to the Game Pit after hiatus. A tonsillitis and virus induced hiatus, Sean. We were playing Real Life Pandemic. We really were. We really were. And we're still not quite eradicated everything. <laughs> it's not going to be possible. I don't think it's eradicated <laughs> everything. The doctor made that clear. <laughs> Yeah, so you saw a pause in the podcast and a pause in the pit stops and everything shut down because we couldn't talk. <laughs> I lost my voice only twice over Christmas, but it was all good. It was a lovely time. I played lots of games. I just had to point at things rather than say anything, much to relief of everyone around me. It was bad to say. Some would say that's not a terrible thing to happen. Well, that's a terrible thing to say. I'm most upset. Anyway... Looking forward into 2018 for our first episode. We're not actually going to review any games today. The 10x10 challenge is something that's been going on Board Game Geek for a while, where people at the beginning of the year choose 10 games that they wish to play 10 times as a sort of way to explore games in a bit more depth, because it's very easy, especially for us because we're reviewing, to play a game three, four, five times, form an opinion, and then never play it again. So... We've been um and ah in about it. We've been tickling around the edges. And this year, Sean, we decide we're actually going to try and do it. Now, try is the very important word in that sentence. <laughs> you don't sound so confident there, Ronan. There's a few of these that I'm, I don't know. <laughs> if I get, if I manage to get six of these to ten plays, I feel like I've done pretty well. I was checking. There was there were six games that I played ten times or more in 2017. Most of them were shorter than the games I've chosen for this, though. You get all excited when you're choosing your 10 by 10 You go like, oh, I'd love to play that. I'd love to play that. They're all six-hour games. I don't care. I'm going to create time out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've chosen some beasts. And there's one particular game that oh, it is going to be a mission to get it played ten times for various reasons. I thought reasons. I'd been overly ambitious, and then I saw your list. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what we're going to do. We're going to run through the 20 games that we're planning to play and give it some sort of uh, format. We've chosen five from 2017 that we thought we've underplayed so far, which is obviously a very easy thing to do. And then five that are just slightly older that deserve a bit more attention. Excellent. And as always, we are very proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there for gaming goodness galore. And if you wish to download our episodes, we're on Podbean stitcher and itunes and of course we have our pit stop videos on youtube okay we're going to kick off and my first choice for my 10 by 10 is forbidden stars 2015 game taking around three hours for two to four players designed by cory kniska James Niffen, who's going to come up on this list later, and Samuel Bailey from Fantasy Flight Games. It is the Warhammer 40,000 themed space combat game, which you get missions which are trying to uh, carry out on a modular map and having ground and fleet battles. Now, this must come up in our mentions of a game that we need to play more, more often than any other game. It's got all the different factions of the Chaos Marines and the Marines and the Orcs and the Eldar. It works two players, three players, and four players. For me, for the theme of Warhammer 40,000, we've been trying to get into more of these games, workshop games, but really struggling with sort of the hobby aspect, having to put the figures together and sort of some of the not that the rules were too complex, but like we've got Necromunda, we've been going through it, it's like a 100-page rule book, and it's very different to our comfort zone. And this is the best use of the Warhammer 40,000 theme that I've ever played so far, uh, branching into that area, hopefully going through 2018. So Forbidden Star Sean has come up again, we keep mentioning it. I need to play it more, that's why I stuck it on my 10 by 10 Ah, oh, Ronan, I still haven't played this. I, I've owned it for a ever? long time. Ever? Never, ever played it. And it's it's something I'm desperate to play, but I just never seem to get round to it. it. Never it never calls to me at the right time when I'm sort of sitting beside it, and I just don't know why. I think having just learned Fallout and Fantasy Flight it's rule books, I think I'm always a little bit frightened of taking on a Fantasy Flight rule book. So that might be some of it, but yeah, it's definitely a game that I need to play very soon. I've said it before. This was one of the first uses of the dual rule book, I think, from memory, and I, I think it really worked with Forbidden Stars. So this is not as hard to learn as it first appears, but it doesn't matter. I know the rules. Let's sit down and play it. What are you after in 2018 getting 10 plays of sure? 
Right, so the first one for me, Ronan, is going to be Orleans. This is the bag building game and the forerunner to the 2017 release, Alta Plano. And why do I want to actually play Orleans? It's because I just don't think I've given it the respect it deserves. I've played it two or three times and I've absolutely loved it. I love the bag building aspect, and th- but there's a lot more to it going on. And I think there's, there's lots of different strategies to try and utilize and get into and find your different paths to victory. And there's so many cool expansions that people are raving about. And I can't really buy the expansions because I haven't played the base game enough. So Orleans is definitely something i want to play a lot more if only to get those expansions Ronan. that is exactly why it nearly made my list exactly <laughs> there's expansion that makes it like a, a co-op or there's a train intrigue there's all sorts and i always look at them i always go i can't i haven't played the base game enough well, my own reasons why i came close short and why I'm, I'm definitely up for playing a few times with you is i want to compare it to alta plano because i've played that we are due to review it and i was not blown away by alta plano at all Mm. which then made me worried about already on. And I feel like I need to go back to it. My last play was in November 2014, and I did enjoy it greatly. And now I need to know whether that was because of the novelty of the bag build mechanism, which we've seen more often, or is it actually a great game and it deserves the glowing memory I have off it. And I want to do that comparison with Outer Play Now. And if, if it lives up to memory, it's definitely going to beat Outer Play Now at the moment. Good stuff. So we're two for two. So that's forbidden stars and Orleans that we are both in agreement we're going to give a go. So that makes it a lot easier. <laughs> it certainly does. Now, I think we're going to be in agreement on the next one, although I don't think we're going to play it together very often. Although I was surprised learning it, Gloomhaven, how easy it would be to drop in and out of the campaign. I hadn't thought that, but we'll get into it in a second. It is the first of my 2017 games. It's around two hours per scenario, one to four player Designed by Isaac Childress and published by Safran Affair. Huge success. Number one game on BGG. Uh, it's a fantasy campaign game in which the actual game is a card-driven, tactical dungeon crawler through a few rooms. But there's much more to it on top. And there's character development and there's stories. And there's unlocking of features and unlocking of characters and developing a city economy. All I haven't got that five to that, so I can't tell you how that all works very well. Other than obviously that sense of exploration is very much there, and I want to explore everything that's in this huge, huge box that it comes in. I've just started a three player campaign, it's myself and Rachel and Eleanor, and they absolutely love it. And they are asking all the time, Can we play Gloomhaven again? Can we play Gloomhaven again? So I think it's going to be one of my easy ones to get 10 plays in of the year. And It's a campaign game that uh, there's been a few that I've tried to get played. It hasn't grabbed one or the other of us, but Gloomhaven's grabbed all three. And and that's sort of real quality time together that we can all spend going forward. So I'm looking forward to it from the exploration, from the gameplay itself, from the fact that we'll be spending the time together. And also, Sean, I did mention that you can easily drop into each other's sets and play. You can pick up a character and, and just work it out from there and join in the party. You know, the parties can expand. When you start a scenario, it always scales to however many characters you're using. People are playing it solo using like six characters at once and mixing and matching their parties up so they can explore all six base characters that are in there. It's a really flexible system, surprisingly, for a campaign game where usually you think, right, we start with this party, we just have to continue along the rails with it. Not so with Gloomhaven, and I've been really impressed so far, and I hope to continue being impressed. Well, Ronan, you made your list first, and if you hadn't have gotten in first, this would have been top of my list. Absolutely, absolutely love Gloomhaven so far. As you said, so much to explore, so many choices in just those individual scenarios and individual cards. So many choices and difficult and interesting choices to be made. I've read online people have played hundreds and hundreds of hours, finished a campaign, and still estimate that they're only have played about 40% of the game. So there's so much to discover. I'm halfway build, through building my broken token insert for the game, and that'll make it even easier just to bosh out and play a lot more this year. Week three. Broken token insert is starting to defeat me. <laughs> 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 I've only had it six about, months. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about Clear Over these is all this talk about how much is in the box, how much is in the box, and there's so much you can do. You can pick it up. There are rules to just create a dungeon on the fly or just pick a scenario, 
throw some characters into it and start playing. And the actual gameplay of an individual scenario, of the way you use your cards, the way your card system rotates, that cards are your health and you have to discard them, that they've all got dual use and, and you're managing your situation. The gameplay of itself, an individual one or two hour game, is actually fascinating. And I think that's the real genius of it. Of not, even if you took all the other stuff away... An individual game of one scenario is really good fun in itself. So anyway, Sean, you are going to talk about another legacy game. I am, and it's it's one that's kind of received mixed response. Maybe not the the response that everyone thought it would come out. And it's Charterstone, signed by Jamie Stegmeier from Stonewire Games, one to six players. And Charterstone is very much a worker placement game that evolves as you play it. And the, the worker placement areas appear onto the map. I think it's kind of what I will get at the end of this that is kind of really inspiring me to play it. I've played one game so far, and it was it was okay. But it was a very sparse board, obviously, because you're starting with nothing, pretty much. That, that's some glowing praise right there. It was, <laughs> it was okay. No, it, was, it was good enough to make me think, you know what? Once I've got into sort of round two, three, four, it's going to get really interesting. And there's going to be a lot more choices. And as you're growing with the game, the choices aren't going to be overwhelming. So there's that element to it. And also, I want to see what I end up with at the end. Because once you've finished... Then you've got this worker placement game, a final finished piece. So I want to see what myself and Natalie create through playing this game. So yeah, the the end goal is very interesting to me on this one. I'd have to say Chartstone doesn't appeal to me that much. The presentation, the cartoony stuff. My concern, and I do have to reserve judgment because I haven't played it, but my concern is that it's not very innovative apart from that gimmick of the fact that you build up some spaces on the board and then you end up with a different board at the end to to most other people other than that it seemed a bit bog standard euro to steal your phrase sean so mm, uh, someone would have to persuade me quite gently to play the chart stone i'm not that fussed sorry mate I don't think it is that that innovative what once you go beyond the legacy side of it. But it's just you know me, I like to create things when I play a game. I like to see what I've created at the end and that really appeals to me. So that was no, I can, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kinda see it. <laughs> now, talking about bog standard Euro. I hope this game isn't, and it's Hawaii. It's a 2011 release, 90-minute game, two to five players, designed by Greg Dial and published by Hans M. Gluck. It's a Euro on a modular board in which you're attempting to score rich points by going around and getting resources and taking different actions, all themed around Hawaii loosely. It's a 90-minute thinky Euro, and it's one that for the past seven years constantly seems to be almost on the on the play pile and then gets pushed back by the next 90 minute thinking euro and the next 90 minute thinking euro and and new contenders are coming along and and it, it's an area that i think my general game group get excited about like oh 90 minute euro hopefully this is good hopefully this will be good to me in 2017 that well sort of ran a little bit dry there's not that many exciting Euros come out. Uh, I've talked before about the trend for Euro games to be seen as sort of multi, very small steps towards achieving a longer goal and, and much more scripted than the Euros that I would prefer, which might be slightly older fashion in which you've got a bit more freedom and a, you can innovate a little bit more. So uh, maybe it's just me falling out of what's the fashion, but... It's definitely time, I think, for some of the Euros that I have enjoyed in the past to come back out again and have a light shone on them for a lack of new contenders, which I think is a good thing. So that's why Hawaii has made its way onto my 10 by 10 list. Hawaii, Rona, has always been one of those games that kind of fades into other games. I'm never really sure what it is until I pick it up and look at the back and study it. It kind of just fades into that sea of sort of midway euros with with a slight twist and there's a lot or lot that are based on sort of hot and tropical land so it kind of fades away for me and i never really think of it yeah and and sorry i was thinking of a bad joke which didn't really work out which is why i had to pause 
<laughs> so let's get back on track, shall we? Um, in my head, I remember it being surprisingly interesting and innovative and more different to other Euros than I'd expect it to be. But it's a long time since I played, which is why I'm determined to get it back to the table and see whether it is a missed gem and it has got that innovation that's missing in some of the newer titles that have come out. Anyway, Hawaii, Sean, moving on. You've definitely not gone for a Euro here. No, I haven't. It's it's one that I talked about a couple of lessons ago and I was really excited and it appealed to the child in me, so I eventually tracked it down. It's War Quest, which is... It's not. By... What is it? It's War Quest. No, it's not. It's War Quest! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. War Quest! From Glendrover, designed by Mr. B Games and L4 Studios, playing two to four players. It's a game in which you are basically trying to take over the world with your your war band, doing battles, doing quests, trying to earn a certain amount of points. The thing that appeals to me is building up your own army. You're going around the map and you're recruiting your own army and that just appeals to the child within me and it always has done. I always thought about games like that when I when I was a child and thought how cool they would be. And so I had to jump on this one. I also spent a lot of money buying the various expansions so I've got an absolute ton of miniatures for WarQuest and I just need to get it played now because it's just, Natalie doesn't particularly like it. It's very hard to find people who like it. The map's very confusing. It has definitely got problems, but I'm still excited and I still want to play it, Ronan. It's kind of nostalgic fun. It takes me back 25 years when it would have been the best game I'd ever come across in my whole life when I was 14. <laughs> has it got the depth for 10 plays in a year? I think this is more a one play of a year game, and I'm I'm not sure about your choice to make this a ten by ten. This was definitely one of your ambitious ones. I'm like, who are you going to play it with? That's the problem. I might have to just solo it and like <laughs> left hand versus right hand. <laughs> you need to put the call out. We are putting the call out at the end of the show, but the call is going to go out for when we're around place at certain cons. This year, Aircon, Lobster Con, whatever it might be, to come and help us get some of these games played. So, any of the games on this list excite you, note them down, fire us off a message. We're going to remind you at the end because Sean definitely needs help getting Warcrest played. I'll join in once. And that's that's <laughs> not even the hardest one to get played, I think. I know. <laughs> Mate, I'm trying to get it in early here. The call to arms is out. Okay. My fourth game is a 2017 release, and this one is Civilization A New Dawn. Two-hour game, two to four players, designed by James Niffen, and from Fantasy Flight Games. I chose this one specifically. I am a fan of Sid Meier Civilization. I've played the series all the way through. I haven't played six yet. I'm still obsessed by a game in five, and I've been playing too much Football Manager. But anyway, it's a very unusual take from Fantasy Flight Games on this theme. You would usually, I think, expect them to go more along the the military route and have different units. And that's not necessarily what they did with the last Civilization game. The war was there. It was a bit of a funny system. But they've gone completely the other way here. And they've very much abstracted it. And war is all about removing counters before you can get through. And they're just counters that are either fortified or not. And you, and you flip them over. And it's not what people expected. And it's got pretty good reviews from the initial reviews, but I haven't seen too many glowing reviews off it. Now, for me, I want to know whether that is because it didn't meet people's expectations. Because uh, it, especially until you get a few plays in of a game, and we come across this as reviewers, that your expectations very much form your opinions on a game. And you need to give certain games chances to breathe and be their own thing, and not what you want them to be, and then you can judge them on their own merits, and that's what I'm after in Civilization and New Dawn. Now, actually, I've played a bit of a game. I was ill. It was when that bit I lost my voice, and thankfully someone was there and knew the game, Jacob, a friend of ours, and he jumped in and helped me out and took over, so I'd go to bed, which shows you how ill I was. I had to jump out of a game. I was very interested. My brain was firing a bit. I was looking at the different powers that you have. You've got this row of five cards, and you can upgrade them. You can build wonders. And, and it seemed to me there were definite clear strategies to follow 
depending upon where you are, your ball position, what goals you are after. And I really want to give them the chance to explore them and judge this on the game that has been released, not the game that maybe some people want to be released. So that's why Civilization the New Dawn is on my list, Sean. Well, I'm going in with my eyes open because of you obviously discussing it with me. And I think the first Civilization from Fantasy Flight, I think it, uh, very much came third behind Clash of Cultures and Nations for me in that Civ building world. But I still thought it was a good game and I really enjoy Civ building. So I'm definitely interested to give this one a go. I think I probably would have been put off if I hadn't have spoken to you first about it, Ronan. But yeah, I think I'm starting to come around to thinking that actually it sounds quite cool, so quite exciting, slightly different way to do things. So yeah, I'm, I'm well up for this one. Awesome, because I'm going to make you play it, and we're reviewing it soon yeah. as well. So <laughs> get yourself around here. This is top of the to be played pile. This and Reworld. I need to make you play Reworld. Anyway, Sean, your next 2017 game. Okay, so this is one we have reviewed in the past, Ronan. It's Ethnos by Paolo Mori from Cool Mini or Not, playing two to six players. So Ethnos was a very much an area control game where you are got an element of set collection going in and various fantasy creatures that you're going to be using to try and take those areas. For me, Ethnos, it's the going to be the easiest game, I think. For me to get 10 plays of it because it plays extremely quickly you can you can bosh this one out uh, certainly two players in, in 30 minutes three players 45 so i can't see any reason not to play it. i think you've enjoyed it ronan everyone i've played it with has enjoyed it i think it's been really well received and the thing that i really want to investigate in this game is all the different combinations of the creatures to see what works well what doesn't work so well what are the the coolest characters to explore and how you can sort of eke out different strategies from within each character and that's why i want to play ethnos yeah this is a perfect candidate for a 10 by 10 i think this is maybe your second easiest one to get 10 plays in and i'll tell you what the other one is when we get to it i think that especially because you're playing lower player counts maybe there's a couple of variants out there. And if I was going to play it that often, I might explore them a little bit because there's a couple of rough edges. There's a few times where players are just get left fishing from the deck if people are building up big hands. So if I was really going to play it a lot and really dive into it, I might look to variants to keep it fresh. But I'm not committing to play it 10 times, but I'll happily play it half a dozen times this year with you and enjoy the game for what it is because it is a good game and I think this is a good choice. Excellent, Ronan. So, what is your fifth game? My fifth game, and my final game of this half of the podcast, is the two-player 2013 release from White Goblin, designed by Mark Chaplin, and it is Invaders. Invaders is, again, a card game where it's asymmetric. One player plays as an invading alien force, and the other player plays as Earth, real Earth, but slightly in the future, attempting to defend ourselves, and it's like if you ever played Revolver or Revolver 2, it's a beefed up version of that with sort of more powerful cards, a lot more combos, a lot more going on, a board that's involved, a couple of economies that you have to manage. And what Invaders has for me, Sean, is as well as beefing up on that Revolver gameplay, which I love the original Revolver. I quite like Revolver 2 as well, but the original Revolver is bad. And it might be the fact it's got the sci-fi theme on it. Some of that Race for the Galaxy card combo learning and the other thing that, that reminds me of that is that you have to pay cards to play cards and every time you sacrifice something you're kind of giving up an effective strategy in order to follow down another path probably plays longer than race for the galaxy it definitely does you're gonna to have to have a few more things going on the race for the galaxy it's, it's a lot more obviously directly fighty you're combating against each other but it's the combo thing that really has got me thinking and going do you know what i really need to play invaders more and i need to get a regular partner and we need to sit down and learn it i had a regular partner to play revolver and we really got into it and really enjoyed it and got expansions and it was one of the great lunchtime games when i used to have gamers to play with at lunchtime and now invaders i just want to make that next step with it one of the great bargains of Essen 2017 was the fact Invaders was there with Invaders Armageddon expansion and they were cut price. And, and I felt like I ran and shouting at everyone, buy this game, buy this game. It's fantastic and it deserves more of my attention. And I'm, it's one of the games that I've put on this list and I'm really excited to say, commit to, I am going to play more Invaders this year. 
I'm really shocked that you haven't played it, Ronan, because I remember that first game. We were so wowed by it. Yeah, it was. <laughs> we came away sweating. It was so tense. And I think that kind of made me think, yeah, I want to play it more, but I need a little break because it is so to and fro and nail biting and frustrating and brilliant at the same time that. I came away thinking, right, okay, I'm glad I played that, but let's play something a bit <laughs> bit lighter now because I can't take any more. When well, you came away, you were bouncing up and down. Oh, that's, that's so good. So I'm surprised you haven't played it more. It's, uh, you know how long ago it is since we played it? It's three and a half years. Yeah, I know. August 2014. So <laughs> I think you've had enough of a rest, Sean. You're back in. You're back in the rotation. For one game, then for three year rest. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you got to toughen up. Go on, see what's happening this half. Oh, this this was another ambitious choice for you. <laughs> yeah, it really is. But it's it's one that actually a lot of people have been requesting to play with me. So that's why it's on my list. I think it'll be easier than it looks. It's Star Trek Fleet Captains by a whole slew of people: Mike Elliott, Brian Kinsella, and Ethan Pasternak, coming from Whiz Kids, and it's two to four players. I love me a bit of Star Trek. I think this is the best Star Trek game out there on the market. It certainly feels like Star Trek. It feels the thematic. The factions all feel like they're doing what they should be doing. Now, what I haven't done is explored the other factions that they've brought in. You've got the Romulans, you've got the Kardashians, and I've only really explored the... Starfleet and Klingon factions and I haven't really explored them and there's so many different ways to play them there's different card decks that you mix in with each other and you choose your strategy for the game and you choose the characters that you're bringing in and putting onto your bridge and into your engine room and there's so much to do that I feel I've scraped the surface of this one and as a Star Trek fan I really want to get more into it and as I said people have asked me to bring it down to LobsterCon, etc. And I still haven't got it played, so I'm making a mark here, Ronan. I'm going to get this bad boy played this year. Ten times? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought Warcrest was your dreamer's choice, but then, but then you put Fleet Captains in there. Actually, maybe you are more likely to get this played, but there's no way you play it ten times, mate. But I am in. You know I'm in. I really enjoy it. I keep telling you, you have to play the, the six-player team version. It's the best version of it. It does take forever, though. Definitely a con game, but it's a lot of fun. We do need to explore the Dominion expansion as well as the Romulan expansion. Uh, it's just who else you're going to get to play it with. I mean, I'll try and get two or three games with you in. Yeah, two or three with you. Couple with Sam at <laughs> LobsterCon. Couple with Nat. I'm almost there. Wow. I'm glad there's not a baby coming soon or anything. Yeah, and that, she's got five works maternity leave before the baby comes. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly what she's going to be doing, playing four-hour Star Trek games. That's what she wants, obviously. <laughs> okay, so that is us for this half. We will join you again for our next ten games in the second half of the show. Sean, there's a dream game of mine that came out in 2017 I've been looking forward to for at least a year and I have not got around to playing it and it's Spirit Island, a two-hour game, one to four players, designed by R. Eric Royce and published by Greater Than Games. It just sounds so amazing. You are the nature spirits of an island which is being colonised by European powers and you're attempting to fight back using quick powers that happen immediately to destroy their towns and cities and put fear on them and longer powers which have got sort of a, a longer brew to it which will be more powerful in the end hoping that this corruption and the blight of the people coming in doesn't take over before you get to unleash your huge powers. I haven't played it yet because I think I've been waiting to really get through Seventh Continent, which I need to get to the table more and really explore through because I've, only, I've done the initial island six times with different groups of people. We got to the prototype, remember, years ago when Seventh Continent was just a twinkling in the creator's eye. I've been playing that again and I need to get on with it and I don't want to take on another big game until I've got through Seventh Continent and also Gloomhaven and I've made some progress on that and I'm much happier with all the rules in my head so it becomes second nature to get it out. 
and that's put Spirit Island slightly to the back of the queue, but I just cannot forget about it. My expectations for this game are absolutely through the roof, and it's on the 10 by 10 as sort of a reminder to myself to make sure I make room in the schedule of, you know, because it's been sort of a, a theme, I think, of 2017 of longer campaign games, games that can play over multiple sessions. We've got a lot of them on our list, I think, which shows that it's something that we've been after and many other gamers have as well. But not to let these other games slip through the cracks. There's so much depth in Spirit Island. It's getting such amazing reviews. I was reading all about it on the Solitaire Games on Your Table Geek list for, for January and December. And people are just adoring it, and I'm sure I'm going to love it. It's just here to say, Spirit Island, you are going to get a place in this year's schedule for sure. Yeah, it never really appealed to me. The theme didn't really appeal to me. It looks quite fiddly and it's obviously quite a long game. We saw some mammoth sessions of this going on in LobsterCon. So yeah, I, I wouldn't mind playing it once to have a look and see if I do like it. But out of all yours so far, only this is the one I, I'd be least likely to play. That is an awful start for you to the second half. <laughs> you better pick up your game because I am very disappointed in you. I know, I know. Okay, so I'm going to crack on with my number six choice. It's, a 20- it's rubbish. It's a 2016. <laughs> it's not a 2016, it's 2017. I hope it is. The release. It's just. Okay, well, it is. Arbitrary. It's rubbish. You've upset me. Fair enough. It's Justice League Dawn of Heroes from Buster Len and Franz Ruiz. From Abba Games playing and plays two to six players. I still haven't played this one, Ronan. After all my crowing and beaking and yelling from the rooftops before Essen, and we picked it up in Essen, and I still haven't got this one to the table. But I need to play this. It's the Justice League. I love the Justice League. The chance to play as Green Lantern is calling to me, and I still haven't done it. The other things that I'm really interested in is the different ways of playing each of the heroes. So you've got chips for one of them. You've got dice for another. You've got cards, like a hat deck building style for another one. I want to see how they all play, what's more interesting, what's less interesting, and how the game evolves. So Justice League has to be on my list. I need to get this one played, Ronan. Yeah, I'm intrigued by Justice League the information beforehand was a little bit poor we got the rules but we didn't get the scenario book so we didn't really see how it all fit together we just had the Bay of Bones there have been reports of some component issues which is a bit of a worry so I need your, your report back on that very positive reviews here and there very negative reviews here and there so I think it's one of those Marmite games to steal another of your phrases I am very willing to explore it sure I think this is one of the ones I'm most likely to forgive, though, Ronan, because I'm so into the subject matter. And as for the components, yeah, I sat in my Essen room and punching out the components, yeah. The, the actual cardboard is really poor. It was very hard to actually get them out without ripping the, the, the chips and the pieces. Uh, the miniatures are okay. board looks a bit bland, but you... You do fill that up with various things. But yeah, the component quality isn't top notch. I just hope the gameplay is. That's Justice League Dawn of Heroes. I hope so too. For you. (laughs) Even though you were mean about Spirit Island. (laughs) I'm going to move on now. Okay. My next one is Dark Moon. Originally a 2011 uh, release as BSG Express. I don't think it came out as Dark Moon then. It's a one hour game for three to seven players by Evan Derrick and published by Stronghold Games. It is... A kind of a social deduction game in which you have traitors and little people and you're on a space station and it's going wrong and you've got to attempt to fix the repairs and you've all got sets of dice and you need to roll the dice secretly and add them to the tasks and there are more negative sides to the dice than there are positive ones so sometimes you're going to have to not be helpful whether you're a traitor or you're loyal whichever way it works round. I very much enjoy it because it's a social deduction game which I kind of played to death a bit when the original Social Deduction came out with Avalon and all the rest of it. And I haven't really found a pure Social Deduction game after that that I love too much. But this has enough meat on it that I feel like I'm actually playing a game and that there's some framework to your opinions that you're that you're laying out. Yeah, there's some guesswork. You turn nature to the dice. But it's done in an hour. And I think it's the perfect length and weight package to give me what I want from a Social Deduction game as well as feel like I'm playing a real game. 
The reason this is on my 10 by 10 is really because it's a player count challenge. Three is the minimum in the rules. Four is pushing it. You really need five, six or seven to play it. And to get five, six or seven people in my gaming groups who are willing to play a game that's mostly social deduction is really quite difficult. Probably tells me I need to go out more and go to London Ball more stuff like that and get it played. And also the Shadow Corporation expansion came out at Essen and I want to add that into the mix. But I need people who know the base game well enough to be able to fully explore that expansion and get the most out of it. So it's here for me to try and piece together somehow four other people who are interested enough to really give this a few plays so we, we can get into it and get into the pattern because every time I seem to play it I seem to be teaching it there's a couple of people that don't really understand the whole yeah, why are you letting this go why would we do that which helps in one way but doesn't in another and, and this is where I want to get a group that knows Dark Moon really well for me to get 10 plays out of it I'm really sorry Ronan I'm going to upset you again I just did not like this one at all I think the game itself, like structurally and me- mechanism-wise, is fine. But I just think it brings out the worst in people. <sighs> like we've seen in, in the Dice Tower run-through when they had problems. And when I played this, I just, I've never felt so frustrated in a game. It's when, you, when you're literally locked away and you can't do anything because the group's voted against you and you are with the group. There's nothing more frustrating. You can talk until you're blue in the face and it almost feels like the more you talk, the more they disbelieve you. And the, the real culprit is just sitting there laughing at you. And I've never been fr- so frustrated and I thoroughly did not like my one game of this. So I'm sorry, Ronan. I'm definitely not with you on this one. Both you and our lovely Dice Tower colleagues needs to stop taking it so seriously <laughs> it's just an hour of fun if you get locked away it's not going to be longer than for about 20 minutes you just roll with it observe do the best you can laugh at the fact that there's rubbish dice rolls and people are getting stitched up and roll it's a fun game it's not a heavy serious stinky game it's an end of a night game it's after a few beers game it's a game where you go look one of us is going to roll terribly and look like the traitor and it's going to be quite funny for the, for us when we realise it's them that have met, that haven't been disloyal but have looked like they're disloyal all the time. It's just fun, Sean. People take it too seriously. You wanna man. you wanna help the group win the game and you know you're not the traitor and you know that somebody stitched you up and it's really annoying. Even you probably even know who the person is that stitched you up, but nobody will listen, it's really annoying. You can still influence the group subtly. That's all I can say. You're talking to a man, right? Playing social deduction games, if there's a choice to brig anyone right at the beginning of a game, who are they going to brig, Sean? Probably you, but that's because... Probably me. For what reason? You're a bit... Because what? Because I'm me. Because you're you. (laughs) You've got to learn to grow with these things and just go, all right, that's fine. Let's just see how the game goes. Eventually, hopefully, they'll let me out of the brig. (laughs) But you're going in with your eyes open. I'm lovely. I'm not used to being put in the brick. That's what? What? Who told you that? You need to stop talking to your mum before we podcast, okay? Where would I get that information off my mum? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> anyway, wow, this is getting a bit dark. She's a lovely lady. <laughs> okay, so my next choice was influenced heavily by Ronan's surprise that I hadn't played it very much. It's Castles of Burgundy, obviously by Stefan Feld, one of these m- most famous games, and Ravensburger and Allier are the production house and plays two to four players. Now, sitting around at Ronan's house, wondering what to play, I said, oh, maybe Castles of Burgundy, and I think you at that stage you'd played it sort of maybe 20 times in the last week with Rachel because she was mildly obsessed with it. You were like, oh no, and I said I hadn't played it more than once or twice, and you were like, what? Because you know I love Feld, you know I love point salad games, you know I love everything about this game that sings to me and to Natalie, and the fact that we hadn't played it was made you so surprised. So I am vowing to play this one ten times this year, just to just to please you, Ronan. Oh. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for, for pleasing me. You're a very pleasing man. <laughs> <laughs> it, this was been too easy for me to pick for the reasons you said. I played it over 10 times in 2016. I didn't play it over 10 times last year because the card game came out. 
And we took that away with us on holiday a couple of times and played that. But between the two, we played them easily more than 10 times. So you know, this would have been just too easy a pick. It's a great choice. And I would say that Castles of Burgundy is probably, just from absolutely no evidence, but in my head, the most picked 10 by 10 game, I think, on all the lists. Because you just see it come up again and again and again. Because it's varied. It's such a strong game. It's a sticker. It's quite easy to get to the table. It works with different player counts. And it is a fantastic game. Yeah, yeah, I definitely enjoyed my my couple of plays with it, but uh, I think you might have even bought this one for me, Roland, as a as a present or for Natalie, and yeah, definitely high on my list to play this year. Yeah, for Natalie sounds familiar. I think anyway, my next one is 2017 release Dragonfire, ninety minute game for two to six players from Catalyst Game Labs. Dragonfire, they took the engine that's behind Shadowrun Crossfire, a cooperative card game in which you're a bunch of near do wells, or in this case, you're a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons adventurers in Dragonfire, and you have a mission to complete, and you're going to face obstacles, which are usually enemies, and you're going to do a little bit of deck building, and enemies are going to come to individual players and attack them, and you're going to have to break them down by playing cards of four different colors with different actions and different varieties of damage on them to do specific cards colors and levels of damage to each enemy to take them out before they take out a member of your team now dragonfire when it was talked about a while ago i got very excited because i really do enjoy shadow on crossfire and this was supposed to be bringing that system to a mass market and making it simpler and make it more accessible and they've gone completely the other way to get the most out of shadow on crossfire you needed a kind of committed group of four players who knew the game well. And I did get some of my, my buddies interested in it, and we had some fun games of it, and there's a group at London on board who, who knew it very well, and I played with them a couple of times, and I had some fun because we all knew the system. With Dragonfire, they've added more and more onto it, and locations and spell effects and special items and, and all sorts of this, kind of a campaign system as well. There was levelling up in Shadowrun Crossfire, but even more so now in Dragonfire, more stuff added on, all sorts of variety. It came out with three or four expansions immediately as soon as it hit the shops over here. It's on my 10 by 10 because given that, I really need three other committed players to get the most out of it. I'm not sure how likely that is to happen. So I think I'm looking to make Dragonfire my complex solo game for this year uh, where I just delve into this whole system and level up characters and work it all out myself and, in fact, feel really comfortable with it. Although I am comfortable with Shadow Crossfire, I'm really comfortable with it before I start trying to teach other people as well and try and bring them in so that I can ease their experience because uh, trying to teach either of these games without knowing them very, very well it really puts people off. You have to be able to smooth down the edges. So I need to play this at least 10 times to smooth those edges down before I start trying to ease in some other players into my own addiction for this very clever cop system. It's Dragonfire, sure. Yeah, I, I was hoping that this would be a, a more accessible version, but uh, as, as you found out, it's not. I didn't get along with Shadowrun Crossfire, but... I, I want to give it another go because I think I've evolved as a gamer since I played that quite quite a couple of years ago. And I'd like to give Shadow on Crossfire another go. I definitely think this one might be a step too far until I get my head, head round Shadow Run. So yeah, it's not really gonna be for me yet, but maybe if I if I do start enjoying the predecessor. Well, you're sold. You're in. Let's play it. <laughs> Let's do it. I have it all. It's ready to rock. Okay, Sean, your eighth game? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, eighth game is Near and Far from uh, Ryan Laucat, Red Raven Games, and two to four players. So I was always going to sneak at a Laucat game in here, Ronan. It's another kind of legacy-ish game, but what this is very much a storytelling game where the story is going to evolve. Now, I've just played the basic game where you're just going around having a small adventures and picking up a few resources and, and trading them and what have you. And I liked it. I thought it was a good game, but I'm reliably informed that where the, where the heart of this game is, is upgrading your character, going on long missions and finding the storyline of the game. And I'm all about story and game. I love to feel part of a game. And this one seems like it's right up my street. So 
again, it's with Gloomhaven knocking around, which wasn't even one of mine, with Charterstone knocking around. It's going to be a difficult one to get played, but I I think once we get involved in the story, I think it'll be a lot easier. This is probably my most wanted game of 2017, mm. which is a surprise to me. Yeah. I didn't like Above and Below, as you know. No, I didn't. I wasn't that fussed by it. Yeah. yeah. So Nirafi, I kind of dismissed out of hand. I was like, I'm not that fussed. The more I hear glowing reports about it, and they are consistently coming in from all sorts of different things. I see it on geek lists. I see it in videos. I see it in reviews. I see it on Twitter. I see it everywhere. The people are constantly enjoying Near and Far. That it's worn me down from complete disinterest. Not worn me down. It's, it's lifted me up, Sean. Let's look at it the other way around. Glasses are full. From complete disinterest into now thinking, okay, this one I need to keep on the back burner. And again, once I've got through these huge releases from 2017... Unless some massive games go out in 2018, which, you know, it's probably going to happen. But, but this is there as one that I'm thinking that is a goal for me to later on down the line, find a hole in the schedule of a couple of months, get near and far out. I think that maybe if we do want to break from Gloomhaven, if we've really enjoyed that system, it might be a nice palette cleanser for myself and Rachel and Eleanor to play a slightly lighter campaign game that's still got some of those elements that's drawn us in. So I really want to play it. I think that, as you said, to get the best out of it, you're going to need to play it through with the same group. So I'm not sure I can drop in and out of your games as easily, but I think it's a very good choice. See, now, you mentioned playing with Rachel and Lola. I was going to suggest that that could be our game because Natalie really doesn't fancy it based on the first play. She Ooh. has no interest. Now, for work reasons, you very kindly let me stay at your house quite often. I think this could be could be the game that sits in the boot of my car every time I come down to you, and maybe we crack oh, out. Okay. Now, now you're talking. Now you're talking. Okay, I'm in. Yeah, let's cool. do it. All right, that's in then. <laughs> let's do it. That was near and far. What is your ninth game, Roman? Mine is Fields of Arla, a 2014 release, two-hour game for one or two players from Uwe Rosenberg. My copy is a Z-Man game that came from Foreland as well. Now, Fields of Isla is a uh, specifically one or two player Euro game work placement where you build up a little farm in the area where Uwe Rosenberg grew up. It's quite a personal game to him, but it's quite a big, thinky Euro game with different seasons and stuff going on. There's been a problem with Fields of Isla, and I only got it in 2016, and then I haven't been able to mention it, Sean, for a very terrifying reason. Because every time I try and get it down off the shelf uh, and say to Rachel, oh, there's a, an Uwe Rosenberg two-player game here that's quite heavy we could try. She immediately pointed to Feast for Odin and say, well, well, let's just play that instead. And that no! game was forced on me. No! Forced on me, I tell you. <laughs> for the whole of 2016, I lived in fear of mentioning the F word in front of <laughs> and Uwe Rosenberg. <laughs> oh, but Feast for Odin isn't any fun. It feels like work. <laughs> and there's only an illusion of choice. And if one person goes pillaging and other people don't, they're going to win. And the space last bet sucks. <laughs> other than that, you loved it. Yeah. You know, it was okay. It was okay. It wasn't awful, but it certainly wasn't very good. It wasn't very fun. So, okay. I'm hoping I've got to a safe zone. I have managed to avoid playing Feast for Odin for 12 whole months. Can you imagine? That's like a personal goal achieved. You're lucky that Rachel doesn't listen to this because she'd be you're right. I know what we're oh, yeah. doing. It's rude. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try and somehow mention Fields of Ireland without Feast for Odin uh, usurping it on the table and see if I can get it played because hopefully once I get it to play once, because she doesn't really enjoy learning games as much as playing the same game again and again and again, almost the opposite to me. So hopefully if I get to play once, then, then she'll become intrigued and she'll want to delve in and play it again and again. And we'll get Fields of Isla as our heavier Euro two-player game of choice. And there's an expansion coming, which is in some way linked to drinking tea, Sean, which I'm not a big fan of, but, but why not? If you're going to theme an expansion, why not make it about tea drinking? Why not? Why not? Fields of Isla. Yeah, it's one that I've been waiting for you to learn and play so that you can teach it to me. I'm a bit scared. It's a massive box and looks like there's uh, a lot to learn there. 
but yeah, definitely the style from Uwe Rosenberg that I'm more au okay with and more comfortable with in terms of, I don't really like that sort of the spatial aspect games. I didn't really like Feast for Odin. Uh, the only one that I've ever really enjoyed is Patchwork. So, yeah. Bear Park. Oh, Baron Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. But that wasn't Uwe Rosenberg, but I'm talking about Uwe Rosenberg games. Oh, wow. Right, right, fine. All fine, right. Chill. Right. Yeah, be like that. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so definitely back to the style of his that I enjoy. And I probably should have put Caverna down because that's one that's been sitting on my oh. shelves for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot I, I cannot bring myself to play Caverna. I played the two-player version the other day and I was like, eh. Just everything about it screams it's take away everything I like about Agricola. But really? I should play it. See, I think it's going to add everything I, that I want. I know, Agricola. but we've got completely opposite views on what's good about Agricola <laughs> and what is it. So it's like they said, well, how can we make Agricola not fun for Ronan? Oh, we'll take away all the tense tightness and the meanness. And anyway, I don't know. I haven't played it. I'm just talking rubbish as usual. You should probably talk about a game that you know something about and just stop me blathering on. <laughs> Ronan. So my number nine choice is Concordia from Matt Gertz. Coming from PD Verlag, two to five players. It's, this one's a really simple one, Ronan. I love Concordia. I loved the hand management aspect. I loved sort of the taking over the various cities and putting your buildings into the cities and the economy of it. But it didn't quite work for two players. But I've got the two-player map now. And I think that is going to make it even better for me and Nat just to crack out and get really used to this game. Because we don't play a lot of games multiple times. And I think this one is one that Nat loves, I love, with the two-player map in there. I think it's perfect. And I think I, I would be shocked if I don't get 10 plays of this this year. The first thing I wrote down was a safe bet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a quality game. The uh, I don't know because there's a couple of, U- of two player maps I've played on the UK one two player it certainly worked I'd say I enjoy it more with slightly more players but it, it works perfectly with two players you scale the deck and all the rest of it Are you interested in using the Salsa expansion or not Sean? I haven't really looked at it Ronan but uh, I think once I get sort of more more into the game I'll certainly be looking at the other expansions yeah, there's been enough in Concordia and, and a couple of map packs for me that I haven't played Salsi yet. So that's something I'd like to try and and always up for a game of it. I think this will be an easy one to get your 10 plays in. Okay, my last game for the 10x10 10 is a Kickstarter that arrived just before Christmas. We previewed it from a prototype that was sent that actually turned out to be quite a lot of a prototype. It's Mythic Battles Pantheon. 2017 release, 90 minutes, one to four players from Benoit Nost and Eric Boulay from both Monolith and Mythic Games. And we did play that prototype uh, before the Kickstarter. We talked about it. I did a little like eight minute section or something in the middle of a episode and I recommended it. And I'm really glad that I did recommend it. And we do only boost Kickstarters that we've been able to try and that we do genuinely like. So we do get loads of requests. And this is one that I'm glad because I backed it then. I just backed it on the basic level. And the amount of stuff that came in, it wasn't crazy. It wasn't like Seamon levels where you get a huge box and you're like, oh, I'm never going to play this. Kind of, We've said this before. It kind of puts you off but almost almost back in the game because you're like, I'm there, it's too much. This came in a box and another box the same size. They're big boxes, but it all made sense. And I think because the system is simple with depth and I can automatically see that all the extra units I've got, I can just switch them in very easily to what's already in the base box and they just add extra options, but don't mix up the rules too much and don't make it too complicated and don't throw things out of whack. It came with a big scenario book. I was quite surprised by actually because that added a lot of different options in there with co-op play and all against one play and team play and one player plays as loads of monsters in this Greek mythic setting and the others are heroes and gods and they've got a certain amount of time to take the monsters down and, and all a variety, again, all based on a very simple minis system. So I'm really impressed with the system. I was really impressed with the value I got for my Kickstarter pledge. I love the scenarios in there and I talked earlier about Warhammer games and trying to get into more play of minis games and, and kind of branching into an area because it's interesting, but it's, it's not my, my comfort zone, as I said. 
I think between Mythic Battles Pantheon and Shadespire, those are going to be my two gateway drugs in in the beginning of this year into into looking more into tactical minis games. And while I keep saying it's a minis game, it really is a clean system whereby I feel like I'm making decisions more than I'm fighting the rules and checking things all the time. And that's why it's so appealing to me. And I really want to dig my teeth into all the options I've got and all the different ways of playing. And and I just, I'm really hopeful about Myth Battles Pantheon, Sean. I'm really enjoying it. Oh, mate, this is the one I I really, really am gutted. I I miss backing because when I saw some of those miniatures that you got, they were absolutely breathtaking, absolutely beautiful. And they're all creatures and and sort of mythological heroes that you know. So you've got your Medusas and your Hercules and your Zeus and all these things that you already know all are about. And to then have a really clean system, as you said, almost like an intro level, but with lots of variety, it sounds perfect for me. So I'm really, really up for playing this with you. And uh, I've come I've come close a couple of times from buying stuff off, off Facebook and eBay and stuff. So I'm, I'm trying, because I've got the baby coming in April, I'm trying not to take the plunge, but it's difficult. It's a, it's a winner for me. You know what's difficult, don't you? You know what's difficult. I resisted Joan of Arc once because it was back in the autumn and Essen was coming up. We had so many games coming in and the late pledge opens in a couple of days time. 22nd of January it opens up 2018. I'm like, oh, have you seen what you get for your basic pledge of Joan of Arc? <laughs> don't, don't, and there's Nemesis is coming out as well. So Nemesis is coming ne- out. Nemesis yeah. will be out like today as we record this. So it'll be out when this episode is is live. Oh, why did you remind me? Ah, oh, then Lords of Hellas will be in the post soon, Ronan. It's coming. It's coming. Alone is coming. There's loads of uh, coming. Oh. I, I have a decision to make this month whether I. Late pledge for Joan of Arc, which I really didn't want, or I go with Nemesis. I'm really torn between the two. We're, we're going to have to talk. So whichever one you go for, <laughs> I'll go for the other go one. The other one. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm tempted by Joan of Arc. Having seen the quality that has come with Mythic Battles Pantheon, uh, I, it's going to be very hard to resist Joan of Arc, honestly. Yeah, it uh, does. And I love the whole idea and theme of it. And yeah. Anyway, we should move on to your um, last yeah, game. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Light. This is going to be a really easy one to get played. Not. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one I was talking about at the start of the show, and this is going to be, if if I get three plays, I think I'll be doing well. So it's tens a bit ambitious. It's <laughs> This War of Mine, coming from Jakob Wisniewski and uh, Michael Orach, and it's Awaken Realms, who we've just been talking about with Lords of Hellas and Nemesis. And it's one to six players. Now, this war of mine is it's set from the survivor's point of view in a in a war torn city, and basically survival is is what you've got to do in this game. I I don't think I own a more thematic game than this. It is an experience. It's not always fun, but it's always bang on thematic. Sometimes too much so it can be quite upsetting and disturbing at times and that is why i think i'm going to struggle with this but i really do think it's a fantastic project if you don't like the game aspect of it you you've got to you've got to appreciate the project that's gone behind it and the thought that's gone into this but yeah it, it takes a bit of recovering from so you play a game and then you sort of think about it and it's very hard to sort of motivate yourself to go again because it's very hard to survive. So my goals are to play this as much as I can to try and survive. I've not survived yet to, yeah, to try and get over each place and maybe one a month thrown in. One a month would do it. It would. Two a week. That's what you need to do. Of of all 10 games, two a week and you get all 100 plays. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't hack. 10 games of this in a year, <laughs> just uh, both on thematically and also the fact that the gameplay is slightly odd and it has got some ticks to it. And I think if I play it too often, it would irritate me. And those ticks might start to overtake the fantastic experience of playing the game. We did do a huge review of this. We went on for a long time, but we kind of explored some different areas with regards to the game. So I, th- I think it's a review that's worth listening to. If you're going to listen to any of our reviews, it was a few episodes ago. I would say that 
I played my first game of Raid on Taihoku yesterday, which is a Taiwanese cooperative game, which is based on a raid, well, a bombing session, basically, by the US Air Force on Taipei, on Taihoku, uh, in May 1945. And you play as a family during this air raid, and, and you get given, everyone's got a mission that they have to uh, carry out, or they're going to get grenades of effect. Basically, if you don't carry out your mission, by a certain point in the game, you, you're pretty much going to lose. And it's much lighter. It doesn't attempt to go into sort of depths that this world mind does. But there are events such as sexual assault in there, and there, there's darkness for having to, to eat basically animal carcasses, pets, uh, and you can eat the family pets, which creates huge you know, disparity in mood, but it might be anything to keep you alive. It's all a much lighter touch and a lighter brush, but I think it touches on a lot of the same theme, Sean. So it's not the huge experience that this War of Mine is, but it's in a similar ballpark, different mechanically. And that is one that I'd be more likely to come back to and play again and again because of the ease of play. But I wouldn't miss out on never playing this War of Mine. I'm very glad that I did play it because it was a unique experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, quite a difficult one. But yeah, Raiden Toku sounds like something that I'd like to give a go as well if, if it's anything like this War of Mine. But uh, yeah. Shall we, shall we uh, just self promote here and say there's a pit stop that's dropped on it if you want to find out more? Why not? You, you just have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that was our 10 by 10. Uh, whether we make those or not, we will see throughout the year. And uh, hopefully, you will join us in our outro in just a few moments. So thank you very much for joining us in this introduction to our 10 by 10 challenge for 2018. You're going to find out how this goes next January, because if it's gone okay, and we've done like more than half, you're going to get a quick summary show to talk about how each of the games have gone. And if it's just fallen by the wayside, you'll never hear from us again. But if that does go okay, and you like the idea of us doing this, then let us know, Twitter, Facebook, Board Game Geek Guild, email, however you want to do it. Sean will throw out all the listens at the end. Also, I'm going to repeat our call to arms. We are going to be at Aircom the second weekend of March up in uh, Harrogate, in Yorkshire. Uh, we'll be there for the whole weekend. Might be wearing Game Pit t-shirts. Well, our names will be on our badges anyway. If you want to play any of these 20 games with us, please let us know and we will bring them with us and we'll try and schedule something as best you can at a con because it's just going to help us out to get played and we'd love to meet people who listen. We, we do at almost every convention meet some people who listen. It's great to see you. Thank you everyone who comes up and says hello and says that you don't mind what we do. So your help required help us do it at aircon in march and then at the lobster cons if you can make them in may and in november and anywhere else you might see us we're always kind of loath to book things up at Yugo games expo at essen because we're so busy sort of with with industry folk and pretending that we, we know what we're talking about but but maybe even there as well sure we need help yes Ronan, we absolutely do and uh, as you said aircon is going to be the first one we're at uh and it's going to be our first aircon, so we're really looking forward to it. We're there the whole weekend from the Friday through to the Sunday. I think it's the 9th to the 11th of March. And, yeah, really looking forward to it. And if you could help us out with some of those games, then please do. I believe you're roping uh, Dan Hughes into playing something with you. I, I shudder to think what you two are going to get up to. <laughs> yeah, Dan, Dan mentioned maybe hooking up, playing a game, maybe hook some of the other gaming luminaries that are attending and try and get them playing. But uh, yeah, certainly if any of you guys want to... I'm, I'm more in touch with the common man. man. You and your, you and your luminaries. Yeah, yeah. I've always thought <laughs> of Dan's planning the uh, Huddersfield expansion for Star Trek Fleet Captains. <laughs> the Huddersfield Tassians. That's my... Like, yeah, that. <laughs> the Huddersfield of Fire. Uh, we, we better stop there. The jokes aren't getting any better. Thank I'm you. Really not. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Ronan. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, next time round, which should be hot on the heels of this, we are going to give you some quick reviews of slightly lighter games that we've played over the holidays with family. Uh, Sean's case, it's going to be with his son and family, so maybe more family games. Uh, my kid being slightly older, maybe games aimed at a slightly older market. 
<laughs> anyway, we are very proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there and to the Dice Tower itself for gaming goodness galore. As Ronan mentioned, we do have a guild on Board Game Geek, and that's possibly the best way to come and contact us and start a conversation. Yeah, one of the other ways is by emailing us. We are on the Game Pit Podcast at gmail dot com. We're on social media on Facebook and Instagram, and we are also on Twitter at Game Pit Podcast. If you wish to download our podcast episodes, we're on Stitcher, iTunes, and Podbean itself. And we do have our own channel on YouTube now, where you can go and view our pit stop videos, which are very much meant to be a very quick introduction and overview of a load of games that we're covering. So please pop along there. Thank you very much for listening. Music by E. Aaron. Boy, 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 bo